What is going on, Colts Nation? Welcome back to another episode of Bring the Juice. Your guy Cody here, and back on the show, our good friend from the Horseshoe Huddle, Mr. Drake Wally. Drake, thanks for coming on, man. Been a minute. How are you doing? Excited for football season? Training camp's almost here. Yeah, man, it, it has been a little while. Thanks for having me on. It's um, it's been boring, uh, just kind of, and it's been a good thing because typically, as we've recently seen, uh, typically it's nice to not hear any news in this lull. So if you're bored, that's probably a good thing, but it just gets you that much more excited for when these guys finally take the field and finally get the pads on. Absolutely. And, you know, excited because, you know, some opportunities for training camp and hoping to see you and many other people down there here in a couple weeks and in the month of August and things like that. So going to be a great time. But Drake, with that, wanted to kind of talk about today, looking at some players that we really feel like need to step it up here in 2023. We have a good amount of players here. I think between the two of us, we have about 20 players here, which is a lot. And I think given the circumstances, uh, you know, given where the Colts were last year, only winning four games, a lot of players need to step up. Um, and so we kind of had like we made separate lists and I don't think we really ever overlapped, which is kind of crazy. Or even if we did, you know, we we kind of tried to keep it, you know, we tried to get different players that we could talk about just for the sake of discussion, because we're at that spot in the offseason. Like you mentioned, there's not a whole lot going on. So, no. hey, why yeah. not talk about a bunch of players that need to step up here for the Indianapolis Colts? And so the way we're going to do it, Drake, we'll go back and forth. I'll let you start with your first player and then we'll keep going. We'll start on the offensive side of things. We each have five players on the offense and we'll switch to the defensive side of things as well. So, Drake, who is your first player here that you think needs to step up here in 2023? So it's it's probably boring um, and probably kind of a vanilla answer, but it's Jonathan Taylor. All right. It's uh, it's Jonathan Taylor because not because he doesn't have the ability, you know, not because he doesn't have the the will to do it. I mean, again, you go back to 2021. Yes, they had a strong offensive line, good blocking tight ends, but you had for now what looks like a below average quarterback and a, and a, and a wide receiver core that really featured featured Michael Pittman. Uh, and so he still did all that damage with basically shouldering the entire offense last year. He got hurt, but look, this offense might even be looking for like to him more than ever. You got a new coach, you got a brand new quarterback. Who's going to, um, who's actually, even more interesting because he's with Jonathan Taylor and Anthony Richardson. So I think Jonathan Taylor, this is a bounce back year. I, I think that it's a year where he's going to put himself back up there in the top five, top three of those rushing you know, numbers, kind of like he did in 2021 where he led almost all of them. Yeah, and I do think, you know, like it or not, Jonathan Taylor's going to be the feature of this offense. It's just exactly. that's what's going to happen, you know, because you have a rookie quarterback, you know, you're you're trying to get him more comfortable to the NFL game, and having a player like Jonathan Taylor is going to be so helpful for Anthony Richardson if he is, you know, your starter for the majority of the season, if not all of it. So it's very clear it's going to be Jonathan Taylor is the Colts offense, and he's going to be the primary focus like he's been the last couple of years. And, you know, the big big thing is the health factor. If he can stay healthy, um, and hopefully the Colts will be able to maybe do some things like feature a few more of these backs to kind yeah. of take a little bit of, you know, the run off of him, make him maybe not get as many carries as he got in 2021, but maybe the efficiency part of it will go up a little bit more. And, you know, you have a guy like Shane Steichen that hopefully can scheme up some better things than you had a year ago. And, you know, if you if you have a little bit more of a threat, we can actually have a somewhat of a threat of there a vertical passing game, which you have not had the last couple of years, especially. So uh, if you could have that, I think that's going to go a long way for Jonathan Taylor and just, you know, giving him a little bit of a unpredictability of this Colts offense, giving him a little bit of an advantage that he's really not had, honestly, since his rookie year with Phil Rivers, as crazy as that is. So Jonathan Taylor, the first guy here on your list. I'm actually going to go with the guy that's going to be blocking for him. I actually have a couple different players on this one. But the first guy I want to talk about, just due to the nature of the position, I think Bernard Ryman is the guy that he – I thought he played pretty well down the stretch last year at left tackle. But, I mean, I would say, Drake, like left tackle is one of, if not the most important positions on that offensive line you know, protecting that quarterback's blind side. And Ryman showed some really, really good things. He wasn't great at times last year, but I think definitely you can say the good outweighed the bad when it all came down to it. But Bernard Ryman has got to take another step up this year. He's got to cement himself, I think, as one of the better tackles in the in the league. And because that's been an issue, Drake, for the last few years, when Anthony Costanzo hung it up after 2020, you've kind of cycled through left tackles 
and you've had a new left tackle the last two years for your week one starter. So now this is like the first year you feel like we actually have a long-term plan here at left tackle. It's not just a stopgap guy. It's not a guy like last year that didn't even play the position. Like he's had some experience and you feel like it's going to go a little bit better, but you know, Ryman's got to prove that he could be that guy that we saw down, you know, and even better in 2023. And, you know, he did add a lot of muscle, like 10, 15 pounds of muscle um, in the off season. So you think he's going to get better in his strength and his all that kind of things that he kind of struggled in last year. So I think Bernard Ryman certainly needs to be on this list as well. Yeah, and I really like that inclusion because um, he, he, one of the things that I've and I've said this before that I gave Frank Reich so much credit for is when when Ryman did go in there and finally, you know, replace um, I think it was Matt Pryor if I'm not yeah. mistaken at left tackle during that Denver game he had like four false starts and uh, looked like a, just a deer in headlights and you know Reich left him out there. And all it did was benefit him. I mean, you're talking about a guy who used to play tight end. He's still pretty raw at, at left tackle, actually. So for him to finish the year as one of PFF's best blockers for the Colts for the entire season, he was one of the top left tackles in the in the you know the last three or four weeks, um, albeit against kind of weak competition on the line. But still, for a guy like that to make those kind of jumps is huge. And like you said, he put on that weight because one of the biggest things that was uh, you know. A, crit a critique of his is that these these bull rushers would just shove him over, and that's because he was this big, athletic, lanky guy. Well, he's put on that that muscle, so I absolutely love that. Um, I love that you put Bernard Ryman on there because a lot of people wouldn't say, "Hey, he needs to step up" because he is on this trajectory. Well, he is like not even a season in yet to performing at those standards, and you go from Eric Fisher to Jeff Lincoln Bach, I think. Then to Matt Pryor, and, and it's just like this revolving door of left tackles. Can't have that on the blind side. Um, my to kind of keep it on the uh, on the uh, offensive line, I'm going to go with Quentin Nelson. Now, the reason I'm going with Quentin Nelson is because he just didn't really play up to his level last season, and I had to keep telling myself, you know, it's not because he's regressing, and I really don't think it is. I think that. I think Ryan Kelly had a lot of revolving like defensive players coming through his right side at the right guard position with all that mess going on. And then I think that, that Nelson had a lot going on on the left side. And he also had to you know worry about Bernard Ryman, too. A lot of uncertainty for Quentin Nelson last season. And you could tell at the end of the year, I think it was Kevin uh, Bowen or uh, Bowen actually like interviewed him. And you could just tell he wanted to give his Pro Bowl to Grover Stewart. Uh, so Nelson was not happy with his performance. Not only does he need to step up, Cody, I fully expect an absolute tear of a year from this guy. This is a man who is mad, he's angry, and there's no better offensive guard that, uh, uh, you know, no better version of Quentin Nelson than an angry bear that's going to put pancakes on defensive players. Yeah. Yeah. He definitely has been a guy that you're like, what happened to him? You know, like yeah. last year, you're like, this is not the Quentin Nelson that we're used to. You know, the guy that was dominating was, you know, just the energy brought a little bit of life to that offensive line. You're just like, what happened? So, yeah, I think with just getting a new offensive line coach, Tony Soprano Jr., a guy that he just seems so energetic, so ready to roll. And, you know, and I think that's just probably going to be honestly for a lot of these offensive linemen, hopefully, hopefully, you know, a breath of fresh air from what they had last year. So, and Quentin Nelson, a, he's a tone setter on that offensive line. And when he's rolling, everybody's rolling. So mm -hmm. definitely think he deserves to be on this just because he had kind of a bad year last year for his standards. Um, but you did mention Ryan Kelly when I talk about him. I mean, if Quentin Nelson's, you know, was struggling last year, I think Ryan Kelly has been the guy that it's been honestly kind of jarring to see the last couple of years. It feels like he's really just like, especially last year. Like he's really just taken a nosedive in his performance. And you're just like, what is going on? You know, like this is a guy that we were routine, routinely used to seeing him, you know, being a top 10 center and playing very well. You know, it's not like he's super old for an offensive lineman either. So you're like, what is going on, you know, with that? And a lot of it doesn't seem necessarily Drake like it, it was necessarily like a physical thing. It just seemed like it was a lot of, you know, miscommunications, things you're just not used to seeing from Ryan Kelly. And so, you know, he was a guy that I know people, and, and I think it was even reported out there that he was potentially on the trading block earlier in the off season and the Colts elected to bring him back. Um, so you do think, okay, Colts think he, you know, they're going to give him another shot at least. Uh, what are your overall thoughts, man, on, on Ryan Kelly and just what he's got to do this year? Because he's really not guaranteed 
you know, a spot long term on this offensive line for the center position. Yeah, Ryan Kelly is really interesting. He's actually the most uh, experienced offensive player, I think, on the entire Colts offense. Like, literally, he's one of the two 30-year-olds. I think the other one's Luke Rhodes. That tells you how young the team is. Their, their two oldest players are 30. Um, but Ryan Kelly's been on the team, I believe, since 2016. He got a little bit of Andrew Luck. Then he got Jacoby Brissett for an entire season. Then he got a whole year of luck, makes the playoffs. Then he gets J uh, Jacoby Brissett again yeah. with, a, with a dash of Brian Hoyer. Then cool. he gets Phillip Rivers. Then he gets Carson Wentz, Matt Ryan, Sam Ellinger, and Nick Foles. That is daunting to deal with as, an, as a center. The fact that this guy's actually not regressed sooner or been just outright below average what his draft stock was is, is something to behold. I think that... Um, also, you know, his, his it, what was going on with him and his wife, uh, with, with, with the, you know, the incidents that happened with their, with their newborn, uh, and their, ch and their children, uh, that had to have taken a mental toll on him. So now that that's behind him, you know, thank goodness that's behind him. And now that you've got a forward thinking offensive mind, like Shane Steichen, you've got a quarterback that for the love of God can get out of the pocket. I mean, it just really is going to lift, I think, a lot of responsibility off of his shoulders. And like I said, the, you can have all the physical tools. If it's not up here and you've got stuff going on up here, it's really hard to digest an NFL playbook because a lot of it's mental. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think, man, I love that because Ryan Kelly, regardless of what happened, he's going to need to step up. He is the captain of the, of the offensive line. The center has to make all those calls at the line. So I think that's a great one. I think um, to kind of stick to i guess on the on the line there's two guys from the same position that i'm going to put but the first one is kind of a wild card and that's will mallory i'm actually putting him on here because initially when they took him i was like you know i remember i was actually watching uh, you and derek uh doing the uh the live stream for the draft and I was just thinking to myself, when you guys called out Will Mallory, I was like, what in what in the heck are they doing with a tight end? Like, what do they need a tight end for? I love this now. I've been looking back on it. He's the fastest tight end in the draft. He's got really good blocking ability. He's like six foot three or six foot four. The dude is a burner for a guy that's that tall. And I think he's going to be used in some really exotic ways. I think that you could potentially put him on the outside on goal line situations for a mismatch. You could line him up in the slot and just burn say or uh, overpower safeties, burn linebackers. I mean, you could even put him on the end line and block. He's, he's a good blocker for someone that's considered a move tight end. So I think that Will Mallory, that's somebody that as a rookie, yes, I'm going to say it. I think that he's going to need to step up. And I know people will be like, well, isn't, aren't there other names in front of him? Potentially, but there was a reason they picked him. There's a reason they drafted him, and he's going to be used probably more than people expect. Yeah, and I think, yeah, for sure. It, it'll be interesting to see. You know, I actually just talked with Derek. We did a little bit of a dive into the tight ends. We're kind of diving into all the different position groups right now. And I'm like, man, that number three tight end position, it, it's wide open. You know, mm -hmm. it's wide open for business right now. Could it be Mo? Could it be Will Mallory? Could it be, you know, somebody else? Ogletree? Like, there's a lot of guys in there that are going to be competing for that number three spot. And I think Will Mallory is definitely a guy, if he can get on the field, right, he was dealing with a little bit of an injury and OTAs mm -hmm. and stuff. But if he can get on the field, show what he has, I don't see any reason why he wouldn't necessarily make a push for the final 53 man. But I guess we'll find out. Um, another guy that I have, speaking of, you know, some weapons on the offense, I think Michael Pittman Jr. is due for a bounce back here, Drake, because last year he led the Colts in pretty much every category, you know, catches, targets, receptions. I don't remember if it was touchdowns or not, but he definitely was their leading receiver in a lot of aspects. So, uh, you know, but all things considered, it was crazy. It's a crazy stat. Like he didn't even eclipse a thousand yards somehow. You know, he was one of two players, the other one being a running back that didn't, that had over what, 84 catches or something, didn't eclipse a thousand yards. So, you know, Pittman was the guy, but it just felt like it wasn't like what we're used to with Michael Pittman. And I think in part due to, you know, not really having an offensive mind that could scheme up anything and certainly not having a quarterback that could get the ball down the field to him. So it seemed like there was a lot of those short, you know, kind of passes. And and it seemed like Pittman at certain points, you know, I have to pin it all on that. Like Pittman definitely had his issues last year, right? Dropping some easy passes, fumbling some balls. It's just like not things you're used to with Michael Pittman. And so I think now with a new system, you mentioned a new quarterback, like just a whole – it's just kind of like a renewed mindset on this offense in general. 
I think we can, we're going to see probably more of the 2021 Michael Pittman, hopefully, uh, than the 2022 Michael Pittman because he's still going to be that number one receiver for Indianapolis. It's just like now hopefully they're going to give him more opportunities that they gave him in 2021 where he can go up and he can make a play right when he needs to in a jump 50-50 ball. That's kind of what he did really well in 2021. Right. If you can give him those opportunities, I think he has a great chance here to establish himself and actually earn a pretty nice payday, you know, depending what the Colts decide to do with that extension coming up. But, you know, finally silencing the doubters. I think he has a good chance to do that this year if he makes a good, you know, a really good step in the right direction. But regardless of what happens, the Colts are going to need him, Drake. The Colts are going to need him to be that true number one wide receiver. And so for that reason, I think Michael Pittman has to step up here in 2023. Yeah, and you know a lot of these offensive players, Cody. They've they, if you if they've been on the team from 2016 on, which a lot of them have, uh, or recent, they've dealt with nothing but rotations at quarterback. I mean, Michael Pittman literally is three years into the NFL. How many receivers can put up 88 catches, uh, 1,082 receiving yards, six touchdowns, followed up with career highs in targets with 141, 99 catches, career high. Now, obviously, the touchdowns slumped, the yards per catch slumped, but you had Sam Ellinger, who might have been facing competition he wasn't ready for. You had Nick Foles, who, I, I look, I'm just going to be honest, burnt. Okay, he was just burnt. He just could not – he couldn't find anybody but the defense. And Matt Ryan could not get the ball down the field and, and mix that with the fact that he didn't have the time. So the fact that he still put up career highs and receptions and targets and he caught 70% of those, those passes – that is huge. He's had five starting quarterbacks. It's really hard to establish establish yourself as a receiver when you are the number one option by a long shot in the receiving game, and you're mixing it with very mundane play calling like what Jeff Saturday and Frank Reich would do at times, and you're mixing it with just this constant rotation of quarterbacks and no offensive line. Michael Pittman's due. He's due for a bounce back. I think that now you've got a real – downfield threat because look one thing Carson Wentz did do he would throw that football down the field that dude did not lack arm strength he didn't lack moxie to take those shots Michael Pittman made defenses pay sometimes when he would take those deep shots so I fully expect Michael Pittman to still be the volume guy but he's going to be a downfield threat again he's going to be able to go down the field and use that six foot four six foot you know three inch frame or whatever he's a big dude um, not your finesse runner. He's more of the, I'm going to lower my pads and run through you type guy. So I love that inclusion. I also, for mine, for my next one, it's actually someone who's the, on the opposite end and that's Alec Pierce. Now, the reason I say Alec Pierce is because he had a very limited, like sample size of being able to show people what he could do just because he is not like Michael Pittman. This is a guy who's the downfield threat. He's a vertical guy. He actually needs to improve his route running to make himself more legitimate. But I'm telling you, he's very fast and he's the downfield threat. I think that you, I think he only had like two touchdown catches, which is criminal. It seems like he had more, but you're going to see a lot more of him. I think he's going to need to step up. He needs to get better at, like I said, that route running. Probably needs to improve his blocking once those plays in the run break loose with guys like Richardson, you know, Taylor, and that committee they've got in the backfield. I really like Steichen's game plan of explosive shots to kind of tenderize that linebacker core and that pass rush with guys like Alec Pierce. It's going to open up a lot of opportunities too. So look for Alec Pierce. I, I, I mean – you got to temper expectations because it could be Richardson. Um, I'd say it. He's going to at least have 55, 60 catches, probably like 800 yards. But you're going to see over five touchdown catches. I think that he's going to be one of those real big red zone threats. He makes He's going to make his bread literally catching those 50-50 balls. Look for him to have a, a good bounce back season. You know, I was amazed that given the situation last year, coming in as a rookie – I thought all things considered, really, after week one in Houston, where obviously wasn't a great game for him, you know, dropped a touchdown pass, all that stuff. Like I felt like from then on, when he actually got targeted, he was one of the better you know playmakers the Colts had. Yep. I thought given the circumstances, it was a minor miracle, Drake, that he had the amount of yards and the amount of catches that he did. I mean, I thought that he played well. It just was the issue of like, I just felt like they didn't target him nearly enough especially in the red zone, like you mentioned, with that frame, another big body wide receiver that can go do it. If you give them opportunity, they just didn't. So, you know, getting more of that downfield threat, you know, we already know he makes his money, you know, when it comes to the downfield passing. And, you know, that's what 
the thing that Shane Steichen's passing attack is predicated on mm-hmm. is good enough, you know, throwing it deep, those vertical shots. You know, I believe your colleague Zach Hicks pointed out that, you know, Shane Steichen the last couple of years, every single year, his quarterbacks have been in the top 10 when it comes to down, downfield passing 20 plus yards. So I think that's just a match made in heaven there. And, you know, to, to steal your term, it fits like a glove. Like it really does for what Pierce's game is, what the Colts are looking to do. You know, obviously the big thing you talk about route running and just separation as well. You know, I know Alec Pierce really struggled in that department last year, but he has another year this, you know, with this system, working with the similar players he worked with last year. And gets a new opportunity here with Shane Steich and to see the ways that they can utilize him down the field and just in the passing game in general. So he's definitely a guy that I think needs to step up as that wide receiver number two to complement Pittman and really give Richardson or whoever is back there, you know, a solid number two option that can help you out in the red zone. So definitely think Alec Pierce is a guy. Now, Drake, I lied. I said we had five apiece. We actually have four apiece. So we're going to have eight in total um, for myself and eight in total for yourself. So that'll be about 16. So sorry, people. We didn't quite do what I said. but I <laughs> Math is, Matt's not easy sometimes, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, I tell you, that's that's the one uh, subject. Uh, A's and B's, math is always a C. Always happen that way. So uh, one guy that I didn't mention as well on the offensive line wanted to talk about, and I didn't do this on purpose, but I think it actually works out well, Drake, just because – it's a position I feel the least confident about, to be completely honest with you, that right guard position, Will Fries at right guard. I don't know what I, – I, this is one of those things, Drake, where I get it. You want to give Will Fries another opportunity, but I feel like you need to get him some competition out there, right? I feel like you need to go sign a guy like Dalton Risner or somebody like that. Just add more competition. You preach it all the time, and you really haven't made any changes to this offensive line from a year ago. So – I would personally like to see the Colts go out and address it, but if they don't, Will Fries is going to have a great chance here and have a good responsibility too to uh, you know justify the Colts' belief in him at right guard. And uh, I thought he played solid, nothing spectacular, uh, but he does have a chance here. You know, as a former seventh round pick, he has a chance here to you know potentially audition and be that right guard of the future. Now that he's kind of entrenched, has a full off season and all those things to be that guy. Give me your thoughts here on Will Fries at right guard. You know, it's pretty it's pretty brief. I, I actually wrote a piece not long ago where I voiced that I personally thought that it looked a lot like what they were doing last year um, uh, with right guard. They kind of just threw Danny Pinter in there. Now, he was a center originally, um, but they didn't really give him any competition. Now, here's the thing. Will Fries has the right guard experience at least more than what, you know, the aforementioned Pinter did. But here's the thing. I really am right there with you. I think Dalton Reisner, I think Gabe Jackson, I think there are multiple veterans that you could sign for cheap that are going to give you what you want, okay? And they're going to fight for that position. They don't want to be called a veteran that's there to push someone. They want to start, okay? They're there to start. So, um, you know, the Gardner Minshews of the world that accept the backup role, they're not very common. They're really not. So um, I think that that, is is huge i do think that emil emil kior jr i think that he could be a wild card maybe maybe he really is pushing will fries because this is a guy who was supposed to be a fourth round draft pick that went undrafted you know will fries has a chip on his shoulder he's a seventh rounder that um at times looked unstoppable and run blocking but for the most part he was he was on his heels a lot when he was pass blocking and would get shoved right over and he was actually one of the worst graded pass blockers so Right now is the time to shine. Will Fries has got a golden opportunity in front of him. It's starting to look more and more like they are not going to sign a right guard, or maybe they're just taking their time. Uh, but I think they do have a lot of confidence in Will Fries. So um, I, I'm i not really 100% sure on if he is starting caliber. But kind of like you said, you know, to kind of round out the offense, I, I we'll, we'll have to see. It, we don't see what they see in, in, uh, in, in the – um, you know, in the film room and when they're talking, you know, amongst themselves as coaches. But uh, Will Fries has got a golden opportunity in front of him and he's going to have to improve that pass blocking or it could be a rough year. Absolutely. Let's switch it over now to the defensive side of things. Drake, who is your first guy here that you want to talk about? So my first one is my first one is Samson Ebicom. And I have Samson Ebicom on here because he has been brought over to start. OK, his 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 previous experience in the NFL, he was that depth piece that never eclipsed five sacks. Um, but you know, people tend to look at numbers. Numbers are very, very 
good to reference, but they can also lie to you. Um, this is a guy who constantly put pass pressure on quarterbacks. He is like a motor in human form, and he is a dang good run defender. That is something that the, uh, the former defensive end, now free agent Yannick Ngakwe, was not. While he did do a good job sometimes of getting those cleanup sacks and those speed rushes, he would over-pursue running backs would just be ran to his side. That's not going to happen with Epicom. I think he's got a great opportunity here. He's been given nearly $10 million a year. I think it's to start, and um, I think it's to really provide that kind of wide stance, quick defensive uh, end that they kind of had with Robert Mathis. You know, he kind of reminds me a little bit in the sub a similar build. So he's been mostly a rotational piece, and he he didn't, you know, he didn't really get a lot of playing time because you were in San Francisco with a lot of dogs on that defense. They were number one in the NFL. I mean, they were incredible. Now you are a more of a feature piece. Look for Samson Ebicom to answer the bell. I think he's an underrated, uh, an underrated player to potentially push 10 sacks. So hmm. wow, okay. All right, Drake, I see you. I see you. <laughs> Maybe All I'm right. hoping too much. <laughs> yeah, well, that would be awesome. That would be great if that happened, but we'll see. I actually, ironically enough, I picked his partner in crime this year, Quiddy Pay, just because, I mean, it's been potential, potential, but not production for Quiddy. And, mm -hmm. you know, some of it was definitely injuries, but, you know, it's just been more of the same when it comes to defensive end. And I don't really know what the deal is. Every It feels like every time Ballard has been drafting these – you're going baby all the way back to like 2018. Like Ballard, for whatever reason, he has not found that dog on that defensive line yet at the defensive end position. And it's been trial and error for so long, man. It's just like, what what's it gonna take for the Colts to get there and get their guy? And so Quiddy has an opportunity here, year number three, starting to get close to potentially looking for a new deal. Like, can he answer the call here? Prove that he can stay healthy, number one. And number two, prove that he can be one of that those feature pieces moving forward on that defensive line, right? The best case scenario would obviously be him and, and Samson being those two guys for the next five to ten years. But, mm -hmm. you know, who knows if that's going to happen? There's a lot of that could happen, but also it could be the other way. It could be another Kamoko Ture situation, Ben Banigou situation. Maybe not Banigou because he didn't really do anything. That may be a little bit harsh, but you know what I mean? Like it could be another former high-round pick that hasn't panned out. And you don't want that to happen, but that could happen. And so he has a great chance here. I think he has probably the best chance of anybody because I think he is more of that complete player overall. Um, he has a great chance here in year number three to really show what he can do. And uh, if he can stay healthy, he has a great chance to be a part of this defense's future and not just another former pick that didn't do much. Yeah, and the thing is with with Quiddy Pay. Um, he was taken, I mean, obviously he's six foot two, he's a little bit shorter for a defensive end, but this is a guy who's really like a short, he's like a short uppercut or a short hook in boxing. It's like not a lot of extension, but good Lord, it, it hits hard. I mean, he's very powerful, very strong. He's got great technique. He's got great footwork. Um, he's hard to move and he plays great run defense too. It's really, can, can he become that guy that, you know, like you said, can he really, consistently put pressure on a quarterback is he going to be the defensive end when when offenses are you know game planning for the Colts are they going to say okay Quiddy Pay's coming off that left side or he's going to be coming off your left or your right side you know like that's that's really what you want to see from Quiddy Pay now last year he played 12 games now he had six sacks he also had 10 quarterback hits he also had 10 tackles for loss I mean he was putting up some good numbers he had 45 tackles those are all career bests um, and he played 15 games in his rookie year. Now he was more of that rotational guy. Um, but yeah, it's all about health. It's all about health with Quiddy Pay. He's got a kind of like um, kind of like we said with Samson Epicom, he's got a golden opportunity because unlike Epicom, he's been here. He 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 was chosen by the Colts out of the gate, out of his college infancy or uh, the infancy of his NFL career. So um some somebody that uh, first off, love that. Love Quiddy Pay on the list. I think that another guy that NFL wise might not be NFL fans might not, you know, know this name household wise, but trust me when I say NFL teams do that play the Colts and that's Grover Stewart. Grover Stewart um, is just incredible. Last season was an incredible season for this guy. I think he had like 70 tackles or something. He had career highs and tackles for loss sacks um, tackles. Uh, I think QB hits. I mean, he had like three passes defense. This was a guy who was busy. 
And the, the way that he steps up isn't run defense. That's his bread and butter. It's not, pre, it's not pressure in the run. It's not, you know, disrupting the interior of the offensive line. It's not staying busy. It's getting pass pressure it's getting to the quarterback it's getting those sacks because he even said he wants to make you know he wants to be a pass disruptor well that's where you get guys like DeForest Buckner DeForest Buckner finds the quarterback he gets to the quarterback and he's done it without a lot of help too in Indianapolis Mm -hmm. um so look Grover Stewart I think needs to take that next step there's potential for a contract to get a contract extension to get done before Taylor and Pittman because it's way easier to get his, his out of the way um, but man, I'm telling you, if they don't give him that contract extension, he goes out there, gets seven sacks or something like that. His value is going to skyrocket. I personally think that it's going to be that regardless of the extension or not, I think Stewart's going to show out. Yeah. That'd be great. If he could add a little bit more, that's always kind of been like, he's great at run defending, but you can only pay those guys so much if they're only one trick ponies. Right exactly. Way. So, you know, at, at the end of the day, it is a passing league after all. So yeah, if you can get to the quarterback and do what you could do from the one tech, that's great. That's that's just an added bonus in there. So if he can do that, yeah, that would be awesome for sure. Um, one guy that I need, uh, we, I think this is pretty obvious as well. A guy that we need to talk about is Shaq Leonard. Oh, I mean, yeah. you we got to talk about him. I mean, the injury and still the uncertainty, and you know, people are going. You've probably seen it, Drake. People are just going all over the place with him. Um, when people are asking, how do you feel? Some people are saying he's going to be fine. Some people are saying his career is over. <laughs> yeah. It's just everything, everywhere, all over the spectrum. But regardless of that, um, I do feel like Shaq definitely need. this is a big year for him, right? He needs to prove that he is fully healthy and he can be that linebacker that we knew a couple seasons ago, right? I mean, when this guy's on the field, Drake, he's a turnover machine. He's probably the best, if not one of the best, in the league in terms of that, in terms of just creating turnovers and doing the things that he did. And and if he can get back on there, that just completely changes the complexion of this defense altogether. So what do you want to see from Shaq, and why do you think he deserves to be on this list? Man, um, you know, last year he played three games, okay? But if we talk about the previous four seasons, we're talking about four, four All-Pros, Okay, three first team, one second team, and then you're talking about three Pro Bowls and a defensive rookie of the year. Mother of God, that is absolutely ridiculous. People would just they there, there's people that would kill for a career like that in your first five seasons. Um, and put it in perspective that last year he didn't even play that much. That's even crazier. Look, Shaq Leonard's focus needs to be health. He just needs to be out there on the field. He needs to get out there on the field. Whether he's you know eighty five percent or hundred percent, you're talking about a top five linebacker in the NFL. If he's out there with Zaire Franklin and he's out there with EJ Speed, you're talking about one of the most intriguing and potentially overlooked linebacking cores. This is a guy who's a turnover machine, and even if he doesn't touch that ball, even if he doesn't make a tackle, quarterbacks are watching him because he always has this knack to get in the passing lanes. So you could potentially get a turnover, and he doesn't even touch the ball because you were trying to avoid him. You know, this is a guy who just changes your entire defense. I think that we're talking about all over the place. Unfortunately, that's totally warranted, right? Because, like, the only person to go off right now is Shaq Leonard, and he's always going to say, I'm good. So um, I personally think that he is on the side of better than not. I think that he's closer to getting out there than what he isn't. Um, But, yes, that is potentially Cody the most important step up on the defensive side so uh love that Uh, we're uh, for my final two I'm going to start going young here Darius Rush Hmm. it was hard to pick between him and Dallas Flowers because they will absolutely battle it out for that CB3 spot um but man Darius Rush the way that he played football at South Carolina it matches what Gus Bradley wants he's a ball hawk he takes it away from you that 2021 defense that was so scary they did that. They took the ball away. All right. They removed the ball from your possession. So um, that's, you know, Carson Wentz, the fact he had 27 touchdown touchdown passes. A lot of that, I think you can, you can thank the defense for setting him up well with a lot of turnovers. So a lot of that is Darius Rush's game. Now that Isaiah Rogers has, you know, effectively been removed from the roster, this is a bigger opportunity than it already was. We already thought that Rush was a steal. We already thought that he was going to play some starting snaps. Well, guess what? Now he is going to compete with a guy who was thought of as a returner only who wants to prove himself too. So I think you're going to see the best out of Darius Rush. If he starts, you're going to see some mistakes. But, man, 
Give him time. This guy is a ball hawk, and he will take that pigskin away from the offense. Yep, and I think in that same vein, because of the situation, Juju Brents is on the list for me as well. Ooh. I mean, he's going to be your cornerback one outside. Like, you're going to potentially, Drake, start two rookies on the outside Gosh. and then Kenny Moore. That, that's just wild to me. Like, it's nuts. Just, just like from where you were last year to where you are now, just totally different in this cornerback room. But, you know, Juju is hopefully going to be re- ready to go for training camp. Seems like he is, you know, missed all the spring. But he has a great chance here, man, to be that number one guy right out of the gate. He's got the size. He's got the athleticism. He's similar to Rush. He's a he's a playmaker, man. He's a playmaker. So he's going to have a chance here. He's probably going to make mistakes as well. I mean, there's no question as a rookie, it's probably going to be tough at times. You know, you're going to face some pretty solid wide receivers, you know, here this season. So he's going to have definitely his rookie moments. But Juju Brents has a chance from day one, Drake, to be the number one corner for the Colts for the future. Yeah, and the thing about Juju Brents is he's one of the longest, like, lankiest cornerbacks ever tested at the Combine. Um, his 40 speed isn't going to blow anything out of, out of the water, but he's more of that zone defender. He's more of that guy that's going to take out the passing lanes. So, actually, he fits Gus Bradley's defense just perfectly. So, he's got a heck of a chance, not even a, not even a good chance. He's got a heck of a chance to succeed because his strengths match what Bradley wants to do with cornerbacks. Now, where he's going to struggle, I think, isn't the – you know, big receivers. I think he's going to match up with them quite well, actually. He's going to be very physical. It's going to be those small twitchy guys like, uh, like you know, uh, DJ Moore, Tyreek Hill, you know, those those guys that are just real small and they, they just move real quick underneath you, too fast for him. I think he's going to have to kind of adjust to NFL speed, but I absolutely love Juju Brents and, and Gus Bradley's defense. Um, to round mine out, it's actually still in the secondary technically, but it's a guy that got pulled last year because they didn't think that he was ready, uh, and that's Nick Cross. Uh, you know, Nick Cross was thought of high enough by the Colts to be selected. I believe he got uh, picked in the third round out of Maryland. Yep, He's only 21 years old. Okay, he's super duper young. Um, they thought he was ready. He went out there in the first two games and just looked very flat, very overwhelmed. And I think it was Rodney McLeod. I can't remember if it was Rodney Thomas or Rodney uh, McLeod that actually got the start because they put him yeah, on the I think the it was line. McLeod. I'm pretty sure yeah. it was Rodney McLeod. Yeah, yeah. Like, the thing is, they have a plan for Nick Cross. They drafted him for a reason. Okay, so you're wrong on how early, how ready he was. Okay, he was only like 20 years old, man. You know, So mm-hmm. uh, I think that the Colts have a different plan this time. The reason that I can't go into more depth is because – we don't know. Well, I mean, it's really hard to see what Nick Cross is going to do because you could be one thing in college. If we're talking about Maryland, he was scary. All right. Now, if we're talking about the NFL, he's a he's a puppy dog right now. Like the, the rest of the league's looking at him like, if this guy's out on the field, we're going to be targeting him. We're going to be running posts right down the middle, hoping that we can just burn him. So he's got a lot to prove, but they took him for a reason. They took those traits high. I think that he's going to show out. And he might even make some big plays kind of like Rodney Thomas did. Right, because even last year, you know, the, when they had three, you know, he wasn't even like he was a four safety last year. They played played three safeties a lot of times. So that third safety, like he's not just going to be a bench warmer. He's nope. going to see the field. He's going to get significant snaps, right? And so he's definitely going to have to rise to the occasion and prove that you know he learned something from last year's benching, and he can be a piece moving forward with this safety room. So definitely think he's one. And I think I will also end with a safety. That is Julian Blackman, who did make the switch as well from free safety to strong safety. Uh, has a great opportunity here in a contract year, Drake, to, to be a part of the solution as well. We'll see kind of maybe that, you know, the move to strong safety maybe amplifies a little bit more of what Julie, of what uh, Julian Blackman's strengths are a little bit better than the free safety position in this defense. So I think he has a great chance here. We already know he can make plays. We already know he plays above his weight for sure. He's definitely a guy that's not afraid to come up and hit and make a tackle. So he has an opportunity here as kind of that veteran in the room, which is crazy to say because he was only drafted in 2020, but he's kind of that vet in that room. He has an opportunity to kind of take on that Rodney McLeod mentor role with these young safeties, you know, Nick Cross, Rodney Thomas, those guys. So I think definitely Julian Blackman has a chance here uh, to, to earn a decent payday here. Yeah. And, you know, uh, you mentioned that move to strong safety. So uh, for the people I know that, you know, a lot of people probably know this, but free safety is more of the pass coverage guy to make it in layman's terms. Strong safety is more of the guy that you use to, to you know, he's kind of like the, 
the big knockout punch. He's the guy that you send on blitzes. He's the guy that's he's the guy that's closer to the line of scrimmage. And you talked about big hits and, and tackling efficiency. Julian Blackman sure seemed to think that strong safety was a better fit for him. He was pretty excited about that move, and it doesn't sound like much to the you know untrained ear or to the untrained eye, but it's a big difference. I mean, you're talking about you know pass coverage for for most of your duties, like Rodney Thomas, as opposed to you know laying the lumber on a crossing receiver like what Julian Blackman does best. So is he Bob Sanders? No. But the thing is, he has that style and that really suits him well. So great addition there. He actually set his career high in tackles last year. We saw most of his promise his rookie season, ironically enough. Um, but he's still only 24, I think, or like 25. He's pretty young. So look for him to make some big plays. I love the fact he played just a Scotia corner. So that maybe that means that he can cover pretty well for a strong safety. So look for Julian Blackman, man. He could make a big impact. Yeah, he did mention that, you know, kind of filling in for Kenny Moore last year, playing near the line of scrimmage, that kind of helped him and kind of helped this transition be a little bit easier. So definitely think that's a good thing for him moving forward. We'll see, you know, if he plays well enough and he earns a contract extension with Indianapolis and they have a really young core of secondary of especially safeties here. I mean, really everywhere. Like it's going to be wild. Like they're going to be starting potentially two rookies, they're going to have two players that are entering year number two and a guy that is just looking for a new contract after this year, his first contract after his rookie rookie contract. So it's going to be interesting for sure. I mean, we'll see who who flies, who flounders. We'll, we'll find out. But guys, let us know your thoughts on some of these players who we think needed to step up for the Indianapolis Colts. Is there anybody else maybe that you would throw on this list? Drake, I'm sure we could have thrown a couple more guys on this list, to be completely honest oh, yeah. with you. But um, we had to narrow it down to actually eight apiece. Um, so let us know, guys, what your thoughts are. Drake, thanks so much, man, for coming on. Really appreciate it. Always a pleasure having you on, man. We'll have to do it again soon. Absolutely. And uh, for all the Colts fans out there, clearly based off of what we've been talking about, a lot of the guys that we put on this list that me and Cody did, they're young. The youth movement on offense and defense, and even in the coaching staff, one of the youngest in the league, it is in full effect at Lucas Oil Stadium. Yes, yes, absolutely. So, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Really appreciate all the support. And as always, guys, go Colts. Yeah.